We have been for the last couple of weeks in Acts chapter 20 looking at Paul's parting words to the church in Ephesus. Now remember he is speaking directly to the elders of the church in Ephesus. He has called them to Miletus where he is on his way back to Jerusalem and he puts together this leadership conference for them. This is the third sermon that we're going to pull out of this, and then next week we'll finish it up. It's a very important text because the Apostle Paul, it's one of the longest sermons or speeches that he gives in the book of Acts. He's gathered these elders from the church in Ephesus, but There's a passage of Scripture I want us to to hold your place there in Acts, if you will, because there is a passage of Scripture in the Old Testament that you and I need to be familiar with to understand what it is that Paul's talking about here in the book of Acts. In Exodus chapter... I'm sorry, in Ezekiel chapter 33, and we'll just touch a little bit on this. We touched on it some in our Wednesday night Bible study. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, speak to your people and say to them, if I bring the sword upon a land and the people of the land take a man from among them and make them their watchman. And if he sees the sword coming upon the land and blows the trumpet and warns the people, then if anyone who hears the sound of the trumpet does not take warning, and the sword comes and takes him, as, takes him away, his blood will be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and did not take warning. His blood will be upon himself. But if he had taken warning, he would have spared his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming... And does not blow the trumpet, so the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any one of them, that person is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me." Paul went back to this passage of Scripture in his sermon in Acts chapter 20 and verse 26. He said, Therefore I testify to you this day, I am innocent of the blood of all. So Paul saw himself as the watchman. He saw himself as the one who was sounding the trumpet And he was innocent of the blood of all men, meaning that he had done his duty in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. But now you need to go over to Exodus chapter 34, because this is where today's sermon, or part part of the passage, is going to come out of, in Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34, and the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, all shepherds of Israel you have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. Now turn back to Acts chapter 20. Paul's preaching this message to the leaders or the elders, if you will, of the church in Ephesus, and he's drawing from Ezekiel because he wants to bring together a very important point, and it has to do with the church in the New Testament versus Israel in the Old Testament. Israel had 
forsaken the people, the shepherds of Israel, speaking of the religious leaders of Israel, had no longer shepherded Israel. They had no longer protected Israel. So what happened was they went their way, and then Jesus came, and Jesus is the great shepherd. That's why when Jesus came, he said, I come to seek and to save the lost. In other words, Jesus was telling the religious leaders of his day, you have not done your job. You did not protect Israel, therefore Israel is now destroyed. I have come, though, as the great shepherd, and Jesus said, I come to seek and to save the lost. That's why the Pharisees had such a difficult time with Jesus, because he didn't fit the religious mold that they had expected him to be, because they had become their own religious mold, taking the law of God, the law of Moses, and adding to that law some 600 traditions of the elders. And they thought, we have created this really neat religious system that people can conform to. So Paul calls together the elders of the church in Ephesus And he's going to directly be speaking to them in our passage today in Acts chapter 20. Let's take a look at it. We're just going to look at a few verses today in verses 28 through 31 of Acts chapter 20. And all of that we read in Ezekiel we're going to pull from, so store it in your mind. Pay careful attention to yourselves. So now he has turned directly to the elders of Ephesus. Pay careful attention attention to yourself and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you an overseer, to care for the church of God, which he has obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish admonish every one of you with tears. When we talk about the church in the New Testament, there's a couple of things that we need to remember as we're sitting here today. Because we use, the, we use the term church very differently than it is used in the Bible. We say, I'm going to church. They, the word church actually in Scripture means an assembly, a meeting. So when we say we're going to church, we're going to the meeting of the church, when the church meets together or assembles together. The church was a meeting of the saved people of God. During that time when they met together. They enjoyed fellowship, the study of the Word, singing hymns to God. They just really encouraged one another when they met together. The other thing that we have to keep in mind when we read the book of Acts is that we are, th- we are the third audience of the text. And by that I mean it was originally written to a Greek audience. Luke wrote to Theopolis, and he is recording the things that took place. So keep in mind it's reaching a Greek audience, a Roman audience, but also there is the audience that Paul was directly speaking to here. So we have two audiences that we have to consider before we get to ourselves. So I always say that's where we get the meaning of the text. Don't just read a text and immediately read yourself into the text. We have to draw the application out of what the text says. So, with all of that in mind, I think we're going to be able to look at this today and see some very interesting things that Paul tells the church elders in Ephesus. One of the things that I caution us against, as I just said, knowing that we are the third audience, one of the things I caution us against is that presupposition of the metaphors of sheep and shepherds. I have to caution us on this because this is, a, this is a big one. Because some people see the metaphors as sheep and shepherds and they say, well, we're all sheep, so we're just all dumb. Let 
The reason we have to caution us with that is because the elders are going to be referred to as shepherds here. So if you have the idea that everyone's sheep and then the elders are shepherds, you're going to have a power dynamic saying they have to lead us, they have to teach us, they have to instruct us. That is a very toxic church to be part of. So we're going to pull from these metaphors from their original meaning here because the Scripture says, the Apostle Paul said, that you and I who are saved have the mind of Christ. So don't, uh, don't ever come into this place and think that the pastor, the teacher, the elders, they have all the answers, and I'm just a dumb sheep here to be led and instructed in whichever way I should go. The Scripture says that if you are saved, you have the mind of Christ, which means that we are all, we are all able to read and understand Scripture. We are all able to teach and instruct one another. And that's why I encourage everyone to come to the Wednesday night Bible study because we have more of a dialogue about what we have read here in the passage so that we can draw from one another. Today, as we come together, we want to engage our minds. We want to read and study and understand Scripture. Paul gives these elders some very specific instructions. Now, I want to look at the text, and we're going to look at these verses one by one. The first one is verse 28. Paul says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Some people consider this verse to be the theological theme of the entire speech that Paul is making. Paul has finished the part of his farewell, farewell speech where he reminded them of his ministry. And now he turns to these elders to give them specific instruction. Paul is not going to be coming through Ephesus again. This is it. This was his last visit. He is now passing on the responsibility to the elders of the church in Ephesus, just as Moses passed on his responsibility to Joshua, just as Elijah did to Elisha, just as David did to Solomon, and more, impo more importantly, just as Jesus did to his disciples. Remember when Jesus washed the disciples' feet, he said, as I have done to you, you do to one another. Be servants to one another. So we see from this that Paul turns to the elders, though, and the very first thing he says, pay careful attention to yourself. Pay careful attention to yourself. Some of your translations may say, take heed to yourself, or keep watch over yourself, or be on guard for yourself. This goes back to the first sermon we preached out of this series of servant leadership. One of the dangers that Paul warned about when people are appointed to be an elder or an overseer of the church was that of pride. And he actually said that a person must not be a recent convert being puffed up with conceit, which is pride, and fall into the condemnation of the devil. It's the same thing that Jesus warned his disciples of in Matthew 18 and in Matthew 23. One interesting thing about the Apostle Paul, we call him the Apostle Paul, but Paul never referred to himself as the Apostle Paul. He referred to himself as Paul called to be an apostle. And that's a very interesting distinction because Paul did not view apostle as a title, he viewed it as a responsibility, as a job, as a calling, but not his title. As a matter of fact, Paul said, I am least of the apostles. I am unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So Paul turns to the elders and he says, first off, 
Watch over yourselves. One of the key principles of being an effective servant leader is to ensure that you are in a good place first. You've probably flown in an airplane living in Alaska. You've probably heard the emergency briefing. I hope you paid attention. Where they told you that if the oxygen mask comes down out of the ceiling, you place it on yourself first, and then you, you tend to those who need help, to the children sitting next to you. But the point of that is that you only have a few seconds, and if you don't tend to yourself first, you're not going to be able to help anyone else. So Paul says to the elders, first off, I want you to watch over yourselves. I want you to take heed to yourself. 1 Timothy 4.16 says, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for so by doing you will not only save yourself, but also your hearers. The elders as shepherds were to watch over themselves and over the flock that they were watching over. But it wasn't, I'm watching to make sure that you are living right. He says, you're watching over something very specific. You are watching over the teaching. It's right there in 1 Timothy 4.16. Keep watch on yourself and on the teaching. By calling them overseers, overseers was not a title. It was a job. It was a responsibility. So as, as a shepherd, shepherd is not your title. It is what you are doing. It is the action that you are called to do. Some people think and this comes from 1 Timothy chapter 3 because some of the translations say if anyone aspires to the office of a bishop or the office of an elder. So some people think, well, it's an office and not a, not, not a, not a job. It's, it's, you know, they differentiate. It's just a, it's a hierarchy of an office but not, not a responsibility that I'm called to do. And that's the thinking that I'm fighting against here because when you actually go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, that word office is put in our English translations, but it's not actually in the Greek. It is the responsibility of overseeing. You are an overseer, so this is what you're supposed to be doing. And what are you supposed to be doing as an overseer is watching over the teaching. So this whole imagery or this metaphor of a shepherd and a flock doesn't have anything to do so much with that sheep are dumb and shepherds have to feed them. It has more to do in this instance, in this sermon, with the protection of the church of God over false teaching. So the shepherds are called to protect the church of Jesus Christ against doctrine that goes against the Word of God. So any doctrine that says, now we know there's gray areas of doctrine, but I'm talking about the, I'm talking about the, the essentials of the Christian faith. Any doctrine that says Jesus Christ was not deity, any doctrine that says Jesus Christ did not die on the cross for the sins of humanity, that he was not buried, and that he did not rise again, those are the heresies that we have to stand guard over. Because... No doubt the church of Jesus Christ will be under attack on those areas. Pay careful attention to yourself and to all the flock. This ties in with Ezekiel 34 because it was in Ezekiel 34 that the shepherds stopped doing this. They stopped watching over Israel and it allowed the enemies to come in and to attack and to conquer now, you have your Bibles there. Flip over to the very last book, the book of Revelation. I said before, we're in a real interesting position because we have the end of the story. Praise God. Revelation chapter 2 says, to the angel of the church in Ephesus. 
Now, this is the people that Paul was just talking to in Acts chapter 20, the elders in Ephesus. He says to the angel of the church in Ephesus, uh, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, I know your works, verse 2, your toil, your patient endurance, how you cannot bear those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know that you are enduring patiently and bearing for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. So Jesus tells the church in Ephesus, you're doing all these things that Paul told you to do. You are guarding over the flock of God, over the church of Ephesus. You are ensuring that not everyone who comes by and says, I'm an apostle or I'm a teacher, gets a platform. Because you have tested them to make sure that what they're going to teach is the truth of God's Word. Now, the elders in Ephesus, they did a wonderful job at that. The only problem was they forgot why they were doing it. They, they fell out of love. It just became this work, this habit. We're, we're testing people that come in and say they're preachers or teachers or apostles, and we're standing guard over the flock of God, but why are we doing all of this? Because we love the Lord Jesus Christ, and we love His church, and we love His people. But they had fallen out of that, and that's why God called them to come back and to repent and to turn back to Him because He wanted the church to be a church that loved Him and did those things because they loved Him. That's where we are called to be, people who love the Lord Jesus Christ, not people who say, I'm doing all of this stuff, so now God notices me. No, I do it and keep no record of what I do because it just flows naturally out of the fact that we love the Lord Jesus Christ. Pay careful attention to yourself. That's what he said. And to all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you an overseer or shepherd, some of your translations may say, to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. Notice in this verse, it was the Holy Spirit who appointed the elders. Even though we knew, or the overseers or the shepherds, even though we know it was Paul who appointed them when he traveled through, Paul saying, that wasn't me. That was the Spirit of God. Notice that Paul says he has made you overseers. Do you see that? He made you overseers. This is to the elders of the church of Ephesus. But he didn't say he has made us. This is because Paul is going to step out of the picture. Now this is your responsibility. I'm handing it off to you. You are the overseers of the church in Ephesus. Paul is going to Jerusalem. He is going to be imprisoned. He's going to die. But the work of the church must go on. So he says to them, he has made you the overseers. Just as Paul did not view the apostle as a title, the term overseers is a function of the elders or a job duty of the elders. The term is used the same for shepherd, which comes out of Ezekiel. Now, remember that, remember that shepherds, shepherds among the Roman citizens were not considered to be outstanding people. So to the Roman audience, they hear shepherd, they hear a couple of things. First, they hear someone who's on the bottom of the occupational level. But this is very important to the Roman audience because when they're reading this, Luke doesn't want the Roman audience who is reading this or hearing this to think that the church is a threat to Rome. Our leaders or overseers are shepherds. 
So in the Roman mind, that instantly says, oh, they're not going to overthrow Rome. They're no threat to Rome. They're, they call their leaders shepherds. These are loving, compassionate people overseeing a flock of sheep out in the wilderness. So Rome says, not a threat to us, but to the Jewish audience, it means something else. To the Jewish audience, it means the church is using the same image, 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 images or metaphors as, or figures of speech as Israel in the Old Testament. So to the Jewish mind, he is saying, oh, the leaders of Israel were called shepherds. The leaders in the church are called shepherds. Israel was called a flock. The church is called a flock. Jesus, Jesus changed the meaning of the term the people of God. It was no longer just Israel. It was Jew and Gentile together in the church of Jesus Christ. This is why in Acts, the religious leaders became so upset and even stoned Stephen to death because Stephen dare mention in his sermon that there is a holy place outside of Israel when he talked about the burning bush where God met with Moses and he said, take off your shoes, the ground you stand on is holy ground. All of this is coming together in the Jewish mind, but also in the Roman mind. They see it. Paul describes the church here, though, in an interesting way. He calls it the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Some of your translations there, because the Greek isn't real clear, might say which he obtained with his blood with his own, meaning he obtained the church with the blood of his own son. Others read like the ESV, he obtained it with his own blood. But the key is that he uses the phrase, the church of God. This also goes back to the Old Testament because Israel was called Israel was called the church of God, the assembly of God, Nehemiah 13.1. And on that day from the book of Moses, they read in the hearing of the people, and it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter into the assembly of God. So what Paul does is he uses a term out of the Old Testament that described Israel and placed it on the church. Paul's putting all the pieces together here. This is a very deep message that he gives to the elders in Ephesus. But the problem was the shepherds of Israel did not protect the flock. They allowed the flock to scatter, which is why when Jesus came and the church was founded, the Jewish people were all over the place. The flock of God was not just in Israel. It was all throughout Greece, all throughout the areas that Paul traveled to and preached the gospel. This is fascinating stuff because Jesus came and said, I'm the great shepherd. I have come to seek and to save the lost. And then he told his disciples, I have sheep that are not of this fold. That's us. He goes to find all the sheep and he gathers them together, Jew and Gentile, into an assembly that Paul says is the church of God. Now remember that Paul just preached last week in our passage about the kingdom of God. And the apostles had begun the, the, uh, the book of Acts by asking Jesus about the kingdom of God. So Paul's just tying all the pieces here together, and it's all playing out throughout Acts to show the picture of God's plan in the world. 
Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you an overseer to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. His own blood. When Christ shed his blood on the cross of Calvary, which we talked about this morning in our Sunday school lesson, it was the blood of deity. Paul is setting the stage for the triune God, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Why is this so critical? Because this is the doctrine so often attacked by false teachers. What do you think of Christ? Whose son is he? Was it royal deity? Was his blood deity or was it human? Also, this point emphasizes the great cost paid for the church. Therefore, the responsibility of overseeing the church is even much more essential because God gave his own blood to purchase the church. But we have some more verses to go through this morning. There's a big game this afternoon also. I'm not a football fan, but I'm going to teach you today. Maybe we'll, we'll practice going into overtime. Okay, so <laughs> all of God's people said amen. <laughs> the next verse, verse 29, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Here he uses the, images, the image of a wolf. It was a common metaphor to describe an enemy. Jesus himself used it in Matthew 7, 15. He said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are wolves. Paul gives them a warning of what's going to happen. We looked ahead already to Revelation chapter 2, and we were like, yes, it did happen. Everyone tried to come in from the outside an attack. They called themselves apostles. They called themselves teachers. But really, they were false prophets trying to, to draw disciples after themselves. But this also goes back to Ezekiel chapter 34, where the flock was scattered because the shepherds ceased to do their job. Peter says in 2 Peter 2, 1, false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who, brought, who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. You want to identify false teachers? This is pretty clear. A lot of what they do is in secret. Their teaching is destructive. They deny the master who bought them. Who's that? Jesus. So they say things such as this. Jesus wasn't really God. He was the brother of Satan. Or they say things like, he didn't become deity until his baptism. Those are teachings that are denying the master who bought them. Any teaching that brings Jesus down, Peter says, so if you have a problem with this, take it up with Peter. He says that is heresy. We are here to lift Jesus up. He is the uncreated one. He is the eternal one. He is the creator of all things. But Peter didn't stop there. Peter went ahead and laid it out even more. He says, in their sensuality, and they will follow their sensuality because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And he even gives you more things to look for. Look for their, sensual, their sensuality. Look for their greed. Do you see that? In their greed, they will exploit you. 
they say things like, give and God will give back to you a hundredfold, or do this and God is obligated somehow to bless you and the whole time they're using that to buy the next Learjet. In their greed, they will exploit you with their false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. John also gave us what to watch for. He said, do not believe every spirit. Don't just believe someone because they come with the Bible and say they are here to talk about Jesus. Don't believe everyone. He says, test the spirits to see if they are of God. Be like a Berean. Remember the Bereans who, when Paul preached, they took the Bible and they searched it to see if what he said was true? That's why in my mind, and I hope in yours also, church is not about you just coming here and me filling you up. It's about us having a dialogue over the Word of God. And then we sit down on Wednesday and we discuss it and and we can ask questions and try to get to the truth of the Word. That's where we want to be. John says, test the spirits. Because there's many false prophets who have gone out in this world. But it always comes back to Jesus. By this you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is of God. False prophets and false teachers also cause division. Romans 16, 17, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause division and create obstacles that are contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught. Avoid them. For such people do not serve our Lord Jesus, but with their own appetite, and by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the simple or the naive. Now, let's turn back to Acts chapter 20 and verse 30. And from among your own selves. So first he says, there's going to be people who come in from the outside, but now he goes a little bit more personal. And he says, there's also going to be people who arise among you, who will speak twisted things. And what is their motivation? To draw people to themselves. This is a shocking statement. Paul is saying not only is the attack of the false prophets going to come from the outside, but there will be people within the church in Ephesus who will want to draw disciples to themselves. First, now let's look at this verse. First, he says, they will rise up. This goes back to the warning of the elders. Keep watch over yourselves. Don't be one of these people who's going to rise up with pride and lift yourself up. Don't be one of those people trying to draw disciples after yourselves. But then he says, they will twist things to draw away disciples. The ultimate goal is to create a following, to draw disciples. It happened to the church of, in, in Galatia. You can write this one down. Read it when you get home, Galatians 1, 6-8. Paul warns the church in Galatia. He says, I am astonished that you're so quickly deserting the gospel or the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you who want to distort the gospel of Christ. This is the same as twisting it. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach anything contrary to the gospel that we have preached, let him be accursed. There are so many examples of this going on today that we could have a list and spend a lot more time together. I won't give you a list, but I'll give you a principle so that you can spot them yourselves. Let's take a look at what Paul says. First, he says that it will be against the gospel of grace. Paul defines the gospel as a gospel of grace. A false teacher will distort this message. When Paul wrote his letter to the churches of Galatia, there were people who who said, okay, you can be saved by grace, but in order to prove or to be sure that you are saved by grace, there's a few things we need you to do. We need you to keep the law. And Paul says, no, this is a perversion of the gospel of grace. It is a distortion of the message. 
So any teaching, this is real simple, any teaching that adds or takes away from the cross of Jesus Christ is twisting the gospel of grace. False teaching is always performance-based. They have manuals, they have rules that you must follow in order to conform. It's performance-based. It's human effort to either prove one's salvation or to maintain one's standing with God. False teaching focuses on the shortcoming of man rather than the finality of the cross. And that's what we taught about today in Sunday school. The cross of Jesus Christ forgave sin all the way back to Adam and Eve, forgives sin all the way forward until the trumpet of the Lord sounds and time is no more. Someone once said, well, how could the cross of Christ forgive sins that were in the future? Well, every sin I've ever committed was in the future of the cross because none of us are 2,000 years old. So for our sins to be forgiven, the cross of Christ had to forgive frontward and to go all the way back so that, as I said in Sunday school this morning, Abraham was able to just to believe God and it was counted to him for righteousness. The only way the cross of Christ could or Abraham could have done that was as if the sacrifice on the cross went all the way back and touched those that had faith. Now, what do I need to know to be saved? There is a cross in which a Savior died. On that cross, with His blood, He purchased the church of God. What more must I know to be saved? There was a tomb that the women came to on the first day of the week. When they came there, it was empty. And the angel said, why are you seeking the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. Go and tell his disciples he's alive. I like to ask some people when I call them the question, how do you know you're saved? How do you know you're saved? So if I call you, maybe I'll ask you that question. How do you know you're saved? I asked someone that last week, and they said, because Jesus died on the cross, and he rose again, and he said, he that believeth in me hath everlasting life. Folks, it's that simple. What do I need to know? What proof do I bring? A cross and a tomb. That's it. I trust Jesus, and I take him at his word. False teaching twists things to draw people away. It's pretty difficult to twist a simple message. That's why false teachers love to complicate it. To have a doctrinal system to, to the, that it takes a theologian to decipher, to make it so complicated that no one really knows whether they're saved or lost, because that is used as manipulation to keep people wondering and fighting and striving to win approval. Acts chapter 20, verse 31 is the last verse of our passage today. He says, therefore, so he sums it up here with the elders, therefore... Be alert. Now remember this just goes right back to verse 28 where he said, pay careful attention. Now he says, be alert. Remember for three years I did not cease day or night to admonish you with tears. There's a couple of points here. Paul compels them to remember the three years of training they have received. The three years of teaching of God's grace. Be watchful. But remember the foundation of truth in which you stand upon. Remember those things that you have been taught. This will be the test because everything that comes along that is new, you hold it to the standard of what you've been taught. For Paul says, I did not cease day and night to instruct you or to teach you. That's what the word admonish means there. 
this figure of speech day and night. It doesn't mean that Paul never slept. It simply means that he took this job so serious, it was a continual work that he did in Ephesus. He loved the church in Ephesus. He spent more time with that church and working with them than any other. But he had a strong emotional connection to that church. That's demonstrated by the fact that he used the word tears. And he has a great desire that these elders continue the work. The teaching of Scripture will always be under attack. Thus, fending off, of, fending off the wolves is a continual work, which is why God has called elders, overseers, shepherds, not to be micromanagers into the lives of everyone who attends, but to guard the flock over false teaching, to be sure that what is being taught, proclaimed, aligns with the Word of God. The elder seer, the overseer, the elder, the shepherd is a function of the church, not an office within the church. And I think I explained that. If you have more questions on that, bring those Wednesday night. We'd love to go deeper into that. The elders were to pay attention to themselves, keeping their pride and their own teaching in check and protect the Lord's church. The church belonged to God. It was purchased with His blood, a reminder of how important the function is of the Lord's body, to watch out for the wolves who are going to seek to attack it. We also today drew the connection Paul made with the writings of the prophet Ezekiel when he connected the church with the kingdom of God, the nation of Israel. In Christ, the definitions have all changed on what it means to be a part of a kingdom and part of God's people. The purpose of Paul was to exhort them to watch for false prophets. And we moved ahead and we went into Revelation and we saw they did a great job at that, but they, they lost the motivation of why they were doing it. They left their first love. They left that realization that the church was bought by the blood of Christ. How about today with you? Where are you? Paul asked the elders to look at themselves. Are you striving to understand truth? Are you a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Maybe you're here and you say, I'm not sure if I'm a part of the family of God. I'd like to know more. I'd like to know how my sins can be forgiven, how I can be adopted into the family of God, how the work of the cross can forgive me today. I compel you to reach out. Ask those questions. Maybe you're here today and you say, I am a believer in Christ, but I, I feel like I, I need to be baptized and I want to follow my Lord in baptism. When you read through the New Testament, every time someone come to faith in Christ, that was always the very next thing they did. So we urge you to come and do that. Let us know that today. Maybe you're here and you say, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, but sometimes I, I feel like that church in Ephesus, and I'm just going through the motions, and it seems like I've left that first love. Well, the great thing about that, and we could preach through the seven letters to the church, the great thing about that is Christ didn't leave them. He was right there all the time. He said, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. All he asked him to do was remember where it all began. And sometimes for us, that's as simple as just remembering when you came to faith in Christ. Talking about when you came to faith in Christ, thinking about when you came to faith in Christ, and all of that excitement that you had when you first realized your sins were forgiven. 
analyze your own life and say, I'm in the faith, but I don't want to just be going through the motions. I want this to be a motivation of being in Christ and Him living through me. And to do that, sometimes we have to heed the warning of the Apostle Paul who said, don't be lifted up with pride. Remember that there is only one great shepherd and we are all servants of that great shepherd. And that keeps our focus on Him. Let's pray.